My name is Vineet. Uh, the IntelliCap team never gave me an opportunity to speak to you <coughs> till now. So uh, thank you for having us here in Kenya. Uh, I think the, uh, the MC forgot to mention that one more gentleman will join us sometime during the panel. Uh, the traffic has kept him away, so we are hoping him to join sometime. He will represent the cabinet secretary who was supposed to join the panel. Uh, and has been nominated by him, so we are waiting for him. Uh, when we actually decided to come to, come to Kenya, uh, one of the things that I was trying to see, what is it the, that we can take back from Kenya? Uh, yesterday's event actually gave me a good idea of what we can import from Kenya. And we have decided to actually import Jeff, because uh, <laughs> the kind of excitement that he created yesterday, I doubt most Indians will ever be do it. And I think he'll have a great role in Bollywood. I, in fact, I was telling him, uh, if you come to Mumbai and if you do one panel with us, rest assured, you will spend 50% of your time in Mumbai. So uh, that's basically the biggest thing I have learned in the last 24 hours, uh, the excitement. And I think the second thing that we basically uh, really, really got excited with, which the way the entrepreneurs actually enjoyed the walk. Frankly speaking, we were trying to imagine it in India and trying to imagine each one of our entrepreneurs trying to do that. And I seriously could not put any one of them to walk the way the other works. So if nothing we can learn, we can learn two things. We can take Jeff from here, which we don't need to learn because I was trying to copy him to start the day today, but realized it's impossible to copy him. So we have to import him. And, uh, but if anything, we can try to walk like the way the entrepreneurs way walk. It's the spirit of Afri Africa that we would like to import to India as well. The panel that we have is about, it's a very state panel, so we'll try to make it very exciting. We're talking about global issues in a very local context. Inclusive development is a very challenging thought process. And in fact, the first thing in the morning I was doing, I was writing my notes and I asked myself, so what does development mean to me? And then the second question was, uh, what happens if you add inclusive to it? And if you Google these two terms, you will actually get World Bank, UNDP and whatnot. Uh, trying to define development for you, as well as inclusive development for you. And uh, ultimately, I thought, let me come up with my own layman's definition of what inclusive development means to me. I think development is freedom, expression, choices on one side. On the other side, it could actually mean infrastructure, economic prosperity, better ways of doing business. Uh, but the moment you use the word inclusive, the focus, the lens changes to disparity, divide, the gap that exists between the two sides. And Within this context, I think if you start looking at it from a global lens, you see the world is not homogeneous. So if you try to come up with a homogeneous definition of inclusive development in US and try to put it, impose it in Kenya, or vice versa, if you do it in Indonesia and try to uh, look at it in India, Indian context, you see that things are different. We see it differently, we mean it differently. And that's basically one of the cho choices and challenges that we have faced as working in the space of development. So I have a very distinguished panel with me. Uh, I think we have the ability to raise some difficult questions. Some of it is applicable to us ourselves. Uh, I will start with my first question to Anthony. Uh, so that everybody knows, I have shared my questions to everybody. So they all know what I'm going to ask them. So even if I don't ask, they will still answer the same thing. But I have decided to change the sequence and change the questions a little bit while I speak. So Anthony is one of the guys who, who, who has actually inspired me. I actually call him the guy who coined the term impact investing. We were actually discussing today. And he says in his biography, he writes, that he convened a meeting that coined the term impact investing. Both of us were there in that meeting. So Anthony, let me ask you this question. You are a guy whose origins from Africa. You have lived in the United States for a long time. You have worked in Kenya. What do you think is the difference in the way development is seen in these two areas. I mean, what is it that's different? And what is it that you believe is the reasons why development is contextual and local rather than actually a global phenomenon? Mm -hmm. uh, th thanks, Vineet. And, uh, so when you hear me talk and looking at me, you might wonder why he said I'm from Africa. Uh, but I was born in South Africa and lived there and then moved to the US, moved back. And I lived in Kenya in 2005 and 2006. So it's great to be back here. Um, and I feel like I can say on behalf of the Kenyans, uh, Karibu to those who are new to Kenya, but it's great to be back in Nairobi. Um, and I work here, when I, when I lived in 
South Africa, I worked with the government um, on issues of human rights, and it became very clear that even though in the late 1990s we had the most progressive constitution in the world, the reality is, is that many individuals did not have the ability to realize their rights because they lacked economic power. And so I think this, the whole question of development, and you mentioned freedom and rights, are very intertwined. Um, and you, know, you said sort of this question of what is local. We've come up with a term impact investing. One of the reasons why we created that term was we saw that people around the world were engaged in these ideas but didn't necessarily see a way to come together. And so the work that Vinit and his team have been pioneering for more than a decade around how investment capital in early stage enterprises in the rural areas in India can be an engine for not only economic growth, but as you said, for the ability for individuals to realize their own aspirations and their freedoms. That work was going on in India. There's been work going on here. Um, everywhere in the world, there are people who are excited about the idea that business and enterprise and investments can be harnessed toward the social goals we care about. So I think that is universal. Um, how it manifests itself in a specific context is very important. I don't think we want to get back to a sort of colonial mentality that says we can define things in one place and impose them on the rest of the world. At the same time, I think it would be a loss if we were so focused on our own uniqueness that we denied the ability to learn from each other. And so when we created the Global Impact Investing Network in 2009, the premise was that people doing the kind of work that Vineet and his team were doing in India, and people doing the kind of work that I was involved in in South Africa, or that many of you are involved in around different parts of Africa, while it is unique and has to be understood in this local context, we really can learn from each other uh, and work together. So I think it's a, I guess I reject both extremes. On one hand, I wouldn't say that everything can just be universally applied. Um, at the same time, I think we would be losing out on, value, on something valuable if we denied the ability to learn from each other. And I think the reality in, in Africa is there is not enough capital in local markets to address all the problems that need addressing, and not just the problems, but all the opportunities. The enterprises in this room, and yesterday was a great example, they need capital and it is not only going to come from local investors. And I think the, the jury and the other people in the room yesterday who committed to talking to some of these enterprises and saying, can we make investments work for you, are part of the story. And so the question is not should we just be local, but how do we make sure that when global capital flows, it flows in the most effective way, it's the most effective enterprises. And I think that's the work of a lot of people in this room and I'm happy to talk more about that in, in detail. I, I won't let you go away, Anthony. I actually want to push a little bit on the discussion you and I had about uh, how the problems and challenges and opportunities are different in different contexts. So you mentioned to me that U.S. and Western societies are actually looking at very different problems yep. and challenges. And their issues of development, therefore, will differ. Mm -hmm. While you are talking about, and in fact, I think one of the uh, entrepreneurs yesterday mentioned, both India and Africa are actually looking at a very large amount of young population walking into an employment-seeking role, mm -hmm. which is not exactly what's happening in Europe and US. Yeah. From that context, mm -hmm. how do you see the challenges? Yeah, so I run an impact investing fund that's focused entirely in the US. And I think one important point is we are all developing countries. None of us, there's no country in the world that has achieved for all of its citizens the kind of life we would like to have or achieve the levels of justice and equality we would like to see. And so this conversation around inclusive development is relative everywhere. And you know, what I was saying to Vineet yesterday is I really believe there's three basic contexts in which we all work. In the West, the main context is that the population is getting very old and more and more government money every year is being spent just to take care of the needs of the older populations, especially related to health care. So the issue in the West is how do we maintain our effective social services as government has less and less money every year to spend? And if you look at those of you from the UK, this question of inclusive development and especially of impact investing is very relevant to the current UK government because that government is pulling back from providing services and looking to the private sector to step back in. So those of us involved in the work we do have something to, the context in which we operate in the West is how do we try and figure out ways that we can step in where the government is stepping back? I think there's two basic contexts in emerging markets. In, in places like India or certain states in India, 
uh, in parts of Brazil and China where there's a lot of economic growth. The question for the social enterprises and the impact investors is how can our investments and businesses enable economic growth to create benefits for more people? And really the story is about harnessing growth but making it be more relevant. And I think some of you in this room are investing in businesses where you're trying to take an emerging middle class or a group of people who used to be subsistence farmers and now can afford to buy some, some things and creating the businesses that allow them to be most productive with, with that little bit of income they have. Um, and then I think, frankly, there's parts of the world in which there is really no engine of economic growth. And these are parts of the world that are suffering from terrible governance, from wars, from basic subsistence economic conditions that are not creating surplus. Um, and there I think we have to be very humble about the role that investment can play um, and recognize that you cannot solve all the world's problems simply by thinking you can make money and make investments, um, but that we have to be working with government and others to create the minimal conditions. But one thing that I think is very important for all of us in this work is that we understand the context we're in. I think we can learn a lot from each other, but we also need to understand that we don't all face exactly the same challenges. I'll actually come to Chris. Uh, Chris, you made a uh, very pertinent uh, closing remarks yesterday. <clears throat> Uh, and thank you for giving the vote of confidence to what Sankal does. But you also made a very cautionary note after celebrating what we were doing at Sankal. <clears throat> and I think uh, whatever little I know of you, what I've realized is even though you have spent a lot of time in a corporate setup, you basically have a very strong entrepreneurial bias. And uh, that entrepreneurial bias means that you have been supporting things in Africa and Asia uh, which are trying to promote the entrepreneurial ecosystem leading to a belief <clears throat> that we can make a change uh, to the world. But is really the impact investing, social entrepreneurship, impact entrepreneurs, the kind of entrepreneurs so are the silver bullet will change the world. If I go by what is happening in G8, unfortunately or unfortunately, I'm also a member of one of the task forces. Uh, the statements that are coming out from there clearly say or believe that this is going to change the world. Uh, what's your view on that and how do you see all right. <clears throat> Thanks, Vinny. Um, let, let me start with a... Ooh. Good morning. Thanks, yes. uh, We'd like to welcome Mr. Okayo, who's joining us on behalf of the minister. <clears throat> and I'll come back to Mr. Okayo, but Chris, can you? Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, let me start with a few personal words as to why I'm in this, uh, in this sector. And then, as Vinny says, maybe share some of the upsides and, and optimism and then from our side some of the realities that we've, we've experienced. Um, so why, why, why am I here? I think yeah, I started off as a small, small uh, an entrepreneur, uh, grew, sold my own business uh, and then went to the development sector. And I guess part of the reason I'm here is frustration actually, um, in that frustration with what I saw as the failed uh, efforts of the, the charitable sector to deliver global development uh, or achieve global development uh, solutions at scale. And the sort of thinking that wouldn't it be interesting to apply a business mindset, uh, almost business DNA coupled with development DNA, to try and tackle these issues. And, and really that's the beginning of what was the Shell Foundation. How do we fuse business thinking with a clear development focus? And when we started off doing this and working like this, you know, terms like social enterprise, impact investing, venture philanthropy weren't in common use. And I think as Anthony's quite rightly said, I mean, it's actually quite nice when you realize that other people are speaking and practicing the same things as you and that you actually feel like you're in a club where, where there are other aligned spirits. So that's really what drew us to here. And if I think through what, what has made the difference in other sectors, if I look at the technology sector, uh, you know, we've all got mobile phones, apps, um, iPads, everything else. I mean, that was essentially based on entrepreneurship, innovation, risk-taking, and support from the capital markets. Now, I think we're at the dawn of a something similar in the impact investing space, where we combine entrepreneurial talent, risk, innovation, with the blend of capital to make it happen. That's, that's hugely inspiring. And I think we'll get there, again, through a fusion of business thinking, business practices, with an understanding of development issues and the challenges thereof. That, to my mind, is a radically different world to 
the world 10, 15 years ago when business was sitting in that corner uh, and the charitable and public sector was sitting in a different corner. So I think it's, it's great that we're collaborative. Now, what have we learned? I mean, I think um, we've, we've learned over the last 10, 14 years that there's some fantastic social enterprises out there. Some of our social enterprises now have achieved scale and financial sustainability. Marvellous. But what have we really learnt about this? And I'll share just three lessons uh, by way of provoking some sort of debate. First of all, this is hard. Look, starting a small business, and I speak as a small business person, my own, is hard doing anything where your sole motive is profit. Doing it with a social objective makes that even more hard. And let's not real. I mean, our experience has been that this is not only hard, it's long. You need a lot of patience, a lot of flexible support to introduce new products and services to markets that have never really experienced those before. This is a long, hard, patient journey. The other thing I would say is no matter what you start with as a business plan, in our experience, you will be on version 9.0 fairly soon in the journey of that business evolution. There is no such thing as a static business plan here. And any investor that looks at a business plan and thinks that they'll adhere to that, I think is in the wrong business. So this is an evolving, evolving landscape. I think the other thing I'd say is that if I look at our social enterprises, no matter how fantastically successful they are, with a few exceptions, most of them are marginal return businesses. Um, and I think we need to be realistic about that. Uh, you know, we can strive to improve cost efficiency and returns, but we're looking at a slew of businesses with, with typically 3 to 5% net return. Um, I think you know, if we really want to leverage private capital at scale, then we have a challenge in terms of getting to higher uh, levels of return. So again, I'd say for those entrepreneurs excited and interested in this space, it's fantastic being an entrepreneur is great, but this is hard, it's a long journey, you need a lot of friends, and your return's probably <coughs> going to be uh, marginal. Then coupled with that, I'd say that if we look at social entrepreneurs, often we find that the, the first customers for these new products and services, the early adopters, aren't the BOP sector. Um, I think that goes across lots of markets. Early adopters tend to be possibly middle class, others who are willing to take a risk on something new. But we do see over time much more deeper penetration to poorer markets. My cautionary note there is, I think, to people who give their money, certainly to early stage things, and want an immediate impact at the BOP level. In our view, that's very difficult to, to, to achieve, and I think we need to be sanguine about that. And lastly, and probably uh, not least, Time and time again, we see fantastic social entrepreneurs doing really interesting things, but their ability to scale up is dependent on the fact that you need to overcome a whole series of market barriers that come into being and stop their growth, whether it's the availability of distribution channels to get product to market, whether it's social marketing to raise uh, consumer demand for a new product or service, whether it's uh, making available uh, uh, the, the standards and codification that demonstrate that, that something is a good quality product and service, which is why organizations like ours have, have had to go beyond just focusing on social enterprise to look at market building initiatives. In that involves including uh, the creation of institutions. So for example, we were one of the co-founders of the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, because without these institutions, you cannot get market development as a whole. Um, so I think, you know, to go back to Vinit's point, this is hugely exciting. I do think there's still a lot of hype uh, about the expectation as to what will be delivered. I think it's a journey we need to stick at, but let's not be kidding ourselves that this is an easy one or a quick one. Um, uh, but, the, but if we can replicate what the success has been on the tech industry, then, then fantastic. Uh, I actually do believe that uh, we are overhyped, under-delivered, over-promised, and actually promising something we don't know we can ever reach. Uh, and Unfortunately, most of us are so busy celebrating that are not even questioning what's wrong with us. Uh, I actually wanted to go to Dr. Okayo. Welcome to the conference, sir. Uh, we are in your country. We are trying to discuss issues about uh, development and also seeing how development can be more inclusive. So can you actually have more people who are not really equal, equal to the others who have got more money, more capital, are in the upper or the middle class, how do you actually bring that? Uh, in your role as the director of the SME, uh, do you believe uh, what, I actually instead of what you believe, what is it that you see happening in Kenya? And people like us who are coming from outside, trying to learn 
and uh, engage with the ch changes that are taking place in Kenya as well as in the whole of Africa. What is it that we can take away, both in terms of how we can participate and what we can learn from here? Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Ezekiah Oke, working with Ministry of Industrialization and Enterprise Development. Sorry for uh, coming late to represent uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Dan Mohamed, who has uh, been called to State House for some urgent matters. <clears throat> yeah, just joining you late, uh, I don't know how far you've gone. But we look at Kenya now in the new constitutional dispensation. I think there's a lot that um, we can be optimistic about because uh, this, you can see there's competition out there that uh, each and every unit of government, the county governments, are gearing to looking for entrepreneurs because they have realized that uh, the national government uh, will not going to support them in a sustainable way. Therefore, creating of businesses, particularly the small and medium enterprises, is the way to go. So that is the first thing that they can uh, address their revenue deficits. You can see that they, have, they are struggling with some things that we know in the long term are not going to be sustained by starting to increase taxation and all that. That's not the long term, but we believe that when we sober down, we'll have to compete to establish a enabling environment to attract small businesses because these are the small businesses that are sustainable. So that's the first thing that uh, we can say that we are glad about to see. Then we are looking also from the national point of view as a ministry on how best can we improve the ease of doing business. If you go to the World Bank ease of doing business reports, the first thing you see is when they focus on the SMEs, the entry point. So the entry point has been a big challenge. We started on well, you look at the overall ease of doing business, we have come down drastically. And as a ministry, we have, uh, which I'll, I'll highlight later on, the how can we improve the ease of doing business, particularly the entry point where the SMEs, including social entrepreneurs, can contribute to job creation. Because if we do not do that, then we believe that uh, the poverty levels will escalate the issues of insecurity and so many things that will come with social evils will continue to proliferate. Therefore, addressing the platform which is a fair and uh, equitable platform where businesses can thrive, can start, can grow, will be the starting point and that is the focus of the ministry at this moment. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Dr. Ekoye, because I, I have a question, an interesting one. You answered it partly right now, but I'll come back to you so that the audience forgets what you have said. <laughs> Anil, uh, when we started Sankal Forum, we had a very relentless and very specific focus on entrepreneurs and investors because we thought the only way we can take this whole idea of impact investing, entrepreneurship, is to connect people together. Over a period of time, we have realized that there is a significant role large corporates have started playing. And in fact, uh, the latest uh, agenda, if you will see, of Sankal Global Forum that we are going to do two months later in India is that we are looking at three pillars for future of Sankal growth. And the third pillar is actually the role that the corporates are playing in pushing the inclusive business agenda. Uh, I see the intervention of the corporates in three forms, and that's what our experience has been in India. They are doing direct intervention, so they're designing products and services. We have Unilever, Tata's, etc., designing products that goes down to the lowest uh, bottom of the pyramid. Then there has actually been a new engagement that we have seen, uh, which is where the corporates are opening their research development facility and are incubating social entrepreneurs. Now there is a tension that exists between that, because the social entrepreneur is never sure, sure whether I'll be gobbled up over a period of time or not. And I know there are some corporates sitting in the audience as well. So that fear continues. Uh, we don't have an answer whether it will happen or not, but that's the second part of the engagement that we are seeing. And the third part of the engagement, which you actually mentioned to me in the morning, is the opening of specifically in India, we have a sort of a law, which is, uh, it's not really a law actually, it's just a guidance saying that corporates must spend 2% of their profit on corporate social responsibility. And that basically brings in comp around $4 billion of capital suddenly in the market, which may start looking at 
engaging with social entrepreneurship as a way of being productive. In view of all these three engagements, what's it that you have seen on ground more so because I have seen largest percent of your global balance sheet is lying in that space. And uh, I'm absolutely right. Uh, thank you, Vineet, for that question, and, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you might know, IFC is a private sector arm of the World Bank. We provide finance and we provide advice uh, for private sector development. Our main stay has been the corporate sector, uh, but increasingly we're focusing on inclusive businesses. These are businesses which have majority of impact on the base of the pyramid. Our inclusive business portfolio, if you look at the website, is about $9 billion over the last nine years. Um, and I'd like to drill down on three aspects that you mentioned. One is corporates that have the base of the pyramid as intrinsic to their business. So these are, whether it's as suppliers or as distributors, um, but increasingly we're looking at value added at the base of the pyramid. But there's a big advantage in a strong supply chain. Firstly, you also set standards. So I'll give you an example of a company, Jen Irrigation, uh, which is out of India, but which has got uh, now established in Kenya as well as in, 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 in Ethiopia. And it, it's the largest supplier of, uh, of mango uh, pulp, second largest exporter of dried onions. So the entire supply chain um, is, is impacting the base of the pyramid, the, the, the small farmers whose income has gone up about four times. But at the same time, we've set up what is called uh, the India Gap Standard. The Global Agriculture Practices is an international standard. It was a level too far for the local farmer in India. And we localized that uh, through this corporate, and now it's an Indian standard. Uh, but the supply chains and the distribution chains that these corporates set up could also be used for developing social services. For example, Unilever, you mentioned quite rightly, extremely uh, strong supply chain, distribution chain at the base of the pyramid. They're using this for distributing pureed water filters. They're doing it on a commercial basis, but they're doing it at the back of the distribution chain that they've developed. For a small entrepreneur to set up a distribution chain is extremely difficult. So this marriage between the corporate supply chains and social enterprises is, is something that I think is, is an example of what, could do, what we could do more going forward. You mentioned uh, incubators. The corporates are also incubators. For example, we invested with a company called Fino, which was spawned by ICICI Bank, Biometric Card Solution, uh, 50 million customers now. M-Pesa, another good example, um, where you can spawn deep pockets, experiment. M-Pesa could not have been done without deep pockets of Vodafone and then you spin it out into a separate corporate entity for profit. And that's a space I think we're seeing much more happening. And, 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 and lastly, really, uh, the corporates as an impact investor in their own right. I'm not mentioning the foundations, you've, you've heard from them already, but because of the CSR law, uh, this 2% uh, has nine line items that the corporates could invest in through their CSR fund. One of them is social business. Clearly, it needs to be defined further, but the enormous play uh, of, of the corporates coming into this space. I'd stop there, but I'd like to ask a question. You mentioned three pillars. Question to you, Vineet, and to everyone else. What about the fourth pillar, which is the government? Brings me back to Dr. Agave. <clears throat> uh, I have a question that, uh, specifically in a country like India, and my guess is true for a country like a uh, continent like Africa as well, possibly world over, the poor are the preserve of the government. That's actually accepted. We all love the poor, and the government loves them the most, and wants to keep them to themselves. We have seen it in India time and again. Every time you actually see an engagement from a private sector happening with the, that sector of the society, the government, and for rightly, for some, sometimes for right reasons actually, because there is a chance of vulnerable uh, population being exploited by money-seeking people. But at the same time, there is a need for cooperation. You mentioned it in your response to my earlier question, that there is a need for us to co-work with social entrepreneurs, impact investors, and other investors to build that relationship. But the tension exists. What is the situation in Kenya? Do you see as these businesses become more influential, become larger, do you see that the government and these businesses will have some sort of tension? Or do you believe, even if those tensions exist, both sides understand that they need to cooperate? I can tell you as an impact investor, I would never in my wildest dream go against the government, come what may. 
I have burned my finger once, I will not burn it again. <laughs> so. Yes, the government of Kenya, if I can um, and, uh, give my humble opinion, is, uh, is aware that um, the challenges of economic development, which at the bottom of level are social challenges, can be addressed from the economic pillar. And that is why the Kenya Vision 2030, which has the three pillars, the social pillar, economic pillar, and uh, political pillar, are integrated. From our point of view, we believe that um, to address the social challenges this country has, we must integrate the economic spectrum starting from the bottom level. And people can remain poor as long as entrepreneurship, culture, and skills is not linked up with the bigger corporates. Therefore, that's why we have bent backwards and look at what is Kenya's comparative advantage that can give us the leverage for economic pillars to benefit this country. We have looked at the potential of agriculture. We have looked at how this sector can be linked up with industrialization, value addition aspects. This is where the spillovers of social entrepreneurship comes on. And therefore, the government is putting a lot of emphasis on building capacity for improving agricultural productivity so that we don't deal with commodities, we deal with value-added products. Once we do that, that is how many countries have linked up agriculture and industries and now they are talking about even the social, I mean the, the services sector that is driving now the economies of the developed world. So we believe that for this country to move forward is not moving forward on the extended hands to receive donations, but to empower people, to empower the rural communities to do business. Therefore, entrepreneurship, culture, and linking up what the comparative advantage in agriculture is with the, with the value addition and, uh, and industrialization will give us the offshoots for other business that the corporates can find linkage. I know issues of uh, subcontracting, even contract farming, giving standards and all that, if we start at those lower levels, then the corporates get the quality that they need and the quality that they need, and that's how now you build the capacity of a society to stand on its feet and the social ills and things that are still affecting people can be addressed. Therefore, agriculture and industry emphasis and linkages is what we are emphasizing on, then the services that can, the transport and other things that come, logistics naturally just comes to support these two pillars, agriculture and industrialization. So this is the emphasis that the county now is in. So the rain-fed agriculture, the poor technologies that are there, even for processing, value addition, the skills that the Indian people have, have into India, and the backyard, the cottage industries are very, very strong, providing a lot of jobs across the spectrum. So this is the way to go. It's not the cooperative come, the cooperative come at the top, then creating business, of course we know that the corporate will not create even the kind of jobs we are looking at. These jobs are at the bottom spectrum and therefore if we broaden the base by giving skills of people, then businesses will thrive and will move on to a level there. We can be subcontracting, we can link it up with businesses. Yeah. So that's the approach that we are having. Brilliant approach because it actually goes on what we define as impact or the social enterprise where you make it implicit to the business model itself. Uh, I think that will reduce the tension for sure. Anthony, I have a very specific question to you. This is my pet brief, brief or brief, whichever way you look at it. Uh, this is as you being the chairman of GEN. I think the new definitions that are emerging on impact investing clearly talks about two things that I have not been able to understand, despite doing it for 13 years. One talks about intention. The second talks about measurement and uh, Largely, I'm talking from an investor perspective. So when we talk about intention, what meter do we have to know what intention do you have? When do you change your intention? And how do I know, finally, actions define good or bad, but sometimes good intentions can lead to bad actions as well. So how do we put intention as a definition and expect me to understand it? That's actually my first question to you. The second is, is intention really a indicator of competence? Because, I mean, this is actually, I'm borrowing somebody's statement, go past to hell has been paved with good intentions. So, uh, is really what we are trying to promote, especially at a global level? 
And the second end on measurement, what are we trying to measure? And why is it that all impact investors are looking at proxies of entrepreneurial impact as their impact? and completely absolving themselves from the responsibility of measuring their own impact. Yeah. So these are two questions I have for you. Well, you sit in a very influential position, you can influence the whole global thinking around it. This is a question that has been bothering me for the last 13 years, and I have not heard an answer to this. So, okay. Well, you probably won't get a satisfactory answer now. But I think that I mean, the gist of your question is, why are we all here at this conference and not down the street at a regular investment conference? And why are the entrepreneurs who came into this competition seeing themselves as social entrepreneurs. And I think we heard this yesterday, those of you who are here, hearing the pitches. It is quite clear that the people who are here talking about the businesses they want to grow are deeply motivated by a sense of, and I heard this a lot, building the nation, supporting the community, uh, creating social good. And so with impact investing, what we have said is there is something qualitatively different about an investor who seeks to use the tools of for-profit investment and the entrepreneurs they invest in who want to build businesses not only to make money but also to address social issues they care about. When the Global Impact Investing Network has meetings around Africa especially, we get pushback from people who say, well, I live in a very poor country. I'm an investor. Any investment I make that is successful creates jobs and wealth. And jobs and wealth is what my country needs. So stop telling me that I need to be meeting these standards. Every investment is an impact investment. And what we believe in the Global Impact Investing Network is without making a judgment of mainstream investments, which will flow to the most profitable opportunities and will play a part in the long-term development of many countries, we are specifically focused on a smaller set of investors who are intentional about seeing investing as a tool for promoting social good and nation building. And so you said, why this focus on intentionality? I think it can get very theoretical and abstract and academic. I don't think anyone in this room wants to hear that academic debate. Um, for me, it's quite simple. When I'm looking at an investor across the table or I'm looking at an entrepreneur we're investing in, is that person someone who I feel an affinity for who's someone who sort of thinks about this in the same way we do. And maybe it's, not, it's hard to define, but it's easy to, to understand. Uh, I think the other very important thing about impact investing is let us all do the things that otherwise couldn't, get, couldn't be done. It's a very simple standard. An investment that would have been done by the mainstream capital markets should be done by the mainstream capital markets. We are all here because we actually want to do more. And we want to do make it a bigger difference than we could be if we were all working in mainstream banks. And so, you know, Chris said this is hard. It's only harder because we've chosen to give ourselves this additional burden of not just doing the easy deals that are not even easy, but not just doing the hard deals, but doing the even harder ones. Um, so I think intentionality, you know, it would be great to be able to measure with absolute certainty um, exactly which investments are making the greatest difference. Uh, the truth is that would be both very difficult, very expensive. You would be spending so much money on measurements and working with professors and having trials and so forth that you wouldn't actually be able to get any work done. Um, so the intention of the investor we find is a very useful measure. As you said, if all we did was invest in people who intended to do good but who ended up being destructive, then clearly we wouldn't be realizing the potential of our industry. The other question you ask is why do we measure proxies so we don't say, did you actually uplift the community? We say, did you serve, you know, do you how many poor farmers are in your supply chain? How many uh, patients go to the clinic? Those are the things we can measure. The things we ultimately care about isn't how many farmers are in your supply chain, but how many of those families have been lifted out of poverty. And it's not just how many patients came to your clinic, but how many of them were healthier because they came. And again, I think the reality is we would love to have the tools to measure the ultimate impacts we care about, those are prohibitively expensive. Um, and so we use these proxies in the meantime. But I, I think to your point, Vineet, we have to do so with humility um, and realize that we cannot assume that just because those proxies are doing well, that necessarily we have the impact we care about. At the Global Impact Investing Network, we've developed a standard called IRIS. And this is an open source standard any of you can use. If you're an entrepreneur, you can go on the website, um, 
believe it's uh, at, on the gen.org, go to IRIS, I R I S. Uh, and it's a set of standards. So when you say, we, I run a, um, you know, one of the examples yesterday, the winners of the prize is someone who's going to be creating jobs. IRIS creates a simple definition for what a job is so that we can compare the investment you would make in continental energy with another investment that claims to be creating jobs. And at least we have the ability to compare one investment to another. So IRIS is a start. It's free. Anyone can use it. And as investors and in investment funds, we're encouraging investment funds to similarly use those metrics so that when you go out and say, I've raised $10 million, and with that $10 million, I've helped create 1,000 jobs and provide decent health care for 2,000 poor people. Those terms like jobs and poor people and health care have standard definitions. So at least we can start to compare. And what I said at the beginning was there is real value in us working together globally and learning from each other. And so those standards are universal. How they'll be applied is going to be very local. Each entrepreneur will choose which metrics are important to them. And each investor will ask their companies to, to select different metrics. But over time, we'll be able to figure out what is going on in India, where a million dollar investment is creating good health care for 5,000 people. And here in Kenya, a million dollar investment is creating health care for 1,000 people. Because we'll have those basic standards, we can start to learn much more from each other. We will continue to have differences, but we'll, we'll take it offline. Uh, I think uh, I have exceeded my time limit. I still have two questions to ask, but I'll leave them all right. Uh, let me give you an opportunity in case the audience want to ask us questions. I can take two questions. Uh, if anybody has any question, an argument is also welcome. OK, looks like we. We don't have any questions, so we can be, we can conclude. Thank you all very much for the very insightful conversation. May I please ask we need to hand over a small token of appreciation to all our speakers. This is a picture of the panel in real time. <laughs> Vinith, uh, before closing, I just wanted to add uh, compliments uh, to you and the Sankalp team for organizing this event. I think it was a really rich event. And it also exemplifies that it has to be a local and regional platform uh, to really make it valuable. There's a global learning, but impact investing is something that's local and regional. To getting down in the region and discussing with entrepreneurs and the government here, I think is excellent. So I think it can be a, a, a platform that you can expand on. Thank compliments. you. I would like to now request that, um, sorry, oh, I'd like to now request that Dr. Hezeka uh, Okeo remain on stage to address uh, the audience on behalf of the Cabinet Secretary for the Ministry of Industrialization and Enterprise Development, Dr. Adan Mohamed. Welcome. Yes, I still aspire to get that uh, DR before my name. So Adam owns it, I don't. So I'm simply Mr. Okeo, the head of SMEs in the Ministry of Industrialization and Enterprise Development. I'm representing someone who speaks off the cuff. Therefore, when he's invited, it's very difficult to connect a cable to his brain into mine so that uh, I can exactly know the two notes he has written on this, on this paper that is handed to me on exactly how he wanted to magnify it with what factor. So it's someone who does not believe in speeches, so he jots them down and can expand them, can constrict them depending on the amount of time he's given. Therefore, his shoes is not uh, the right shoes for me. Leave alone his long trousers. is very, it's a guy who's endowed with, uh, with height compared with mine. So, but looking at his notes and uh, getting the gist of what we, we have here, I would give uh, the following. 
we as uh, the ministry that uh, has been uh, given opportunity to change the face of this country through enterprise development, we are honored to be here and particularly to share with you what we are doing. He wanted to expound on a point here I'm seeing is writing, reimagining capitalism and the role of markets in Africa. So this one was guided by the conference organizers and uh, keeping to how he is addressing us and how he is uh, moving on, he has already led us into what we are calling industrialization roadmap. In this roadmap, that is going to change the face of this country to do two things, create wealth through jobs, and you do that by building innovative entrepreneurship with new ideas, with the new way of doing things. So this is how Adan believes that when he does that, local entrepreneurship through support and building capacities will be created in this country and also supporting opportunity for foreign direct investments that have linkages with the local communities. So in his commitment to drive the roadmap, we are talking about smart master planning. He believes that that smart master planning and roadmaps are the critical starting points for policy development and execution that help to provide avenues to measure and evaluate progress made in turning Kenya in its ambition to become a middle income country by 2030. The aspects that uh, are in that roadmap, we look at ourselves with economies that we can compare with in terms of benchmarks in Africa and the Asian nations that uh, we gain independence at the same time with, we recognize that we have been left behind. And what has driven them forward is industrialization. That is not coming from outside entirely, but industrialization, that is building on the comparative advantage of the country. So in this uh, master planning, we are talking about the gross domestic product of this country that is still very low. Within the remaining 16 years of 2030, if it can be increased through manufacturing sector that is barely contributing 10% of the GDP to be doubled, then we believe that the country with that goal set, we can move forward into the right direction. Therefore, he has committed to address three critical challenges to attain that goal of moving the contribution of the manufacturing sector of GDP by doubling it to 20%. And therefore, he's saying that uh, when we do that, we can uh, have an agenda of tripling our foreign investment capacities. So these are the FDIs that when we bring around can contribute towards the bottom echelon of the society by creating business linkages that are strong with the capacities that come with it. So one strategy is to reduce the cost of doing business, the one I was remarking on, and we have so many parameters that uh, still impede our level of doing business. The entry point, the support services that come with it, that needs to be addressed, and therefore also building the human capacity. <clears throat> We want to build specific sectors and the sectors that we are inviting investors on that will help us to address the social challenges, to remove the faces that are dull and get this bright young African smiling. We are looking at agribusiness as a business because most of the things going on within the areas 
where many Kenyans are is not business at all. It is survival. So we believe that if we could upgrade the capacity of the agricultural sector to give us three things, to give us quality raw material for value addition in food processing, we shall have moved quite a bit. If we build that capacity to give us the raw material for the textile sector that's changed the face of the world, we can move miles. If they can give us the raw materials to provide the leather and leather goods raw materials, then value addition comes. So those three pillars of the agricultural sector is what we are strengthening in our roadmap for agribusiness. So that is the first thing that is doing. The second thing that we are talking about is what we are calling game changers. Game changers that have changed the face of industrialization of the world. We are looking at three broad strategies that can bring foreign direct investment to link up with Kenyans in the, the lower levels. We are building what we are calling special economic zones in three areas where we have the international waters in Mombasa, Greater Mombasa, in Kisumu and Lamu. So this big business, the special economic zones will give opportunity to attract foreign direct investment with, with the linkages with the economy. Then we are bringing Dubai to Kenya, what we are calling free trade zone, so that our investors who are struggling to look outside to bring their raw materials can find the raw materials at closer proximity with these borders. So a free trade zone is under consideration and already there are experts working with us on the ground to just bring the entrepreneurs that once they've come, even the social interventions and the linkage with the economy will come. The third thing that is also critical as a game changer is what we are calling industrial parks. Each and every 47 counties of this country deserves an area where people can do business, both foreign and local, meeting in the middle to create strong supply chains that can give products and services up to the community level. So this is another area that uh, we believe that we have started working on with the governors and the county governments. And then when the issues of doing business comes, we believe that we'll expand the scope of the capacities of the counties to create wealth even at the county level. So those three are what we are calling game changers that will change the face. We are learning from uh, the intervention that have come in the horticultural sector, that this is the sectors that are going to create the clusters that we have seen. You go to a town called Naivasha, where the horticulture sector has come about naturally. So if we could build our comparative advantages around certain products, certain crops, certain natural resources, then we believe that uh, the foreign direct investments can create a lot of business opportunities and even the social entrepreneurship comes along because they come with social amenities, they come with schools, they come with hostels, they come with dispensaries, they come with so many things that uh, improve the quality of life. So for us, that is a good starting point that uh, the Ministry of Industrialization and Enterprise Development is working with development partners and our line ministries and even the social sector to bring. The other thing that uh, Adam is putting in his notes here is uh, the issue of, of integrating technology solutions in the public service delivery. That uh, we are also leveraging technologies to provide services to the communities so that they can uh, get uh, the services of government across. The ICT sector of Kenya is one of the growing sectors, and the recently launched Huduma Kenya program, where government provides its services as one-stop shop to citizens, are something that we want to build around so that uh, we leverage the technology platforms that are there so that uh, we can create opportunities for people to do 
business, either with government, in the policy where we are giving SMEs 30% of public procurement, we are addressing the issues of market access for this sector. This is a sector that is broad, but looking at how they do business, the market is still a challenge. It's identifying four broad areas that this sector suffers from, the SME sector that can easily build the bottom category of uh, enterprises that we link up with the large enterprises. The access to market, access to finance, access to skills and technologies, and access to work sites where they can produce quality and quantity that are desired that can strengthen the, the supply chains with the large corporates is something that uh, is critical. And for such to be realized, the enabling environment, including issues like infrastructures, issues of energy, and issues of ICT, comes on board to build on that. Kenya is uh, a country with a high entrepreneurial culture. So if we could uh, build the linkages between the corporate and the already existing SMEs, we believe that we could leverage the SMEs' capacity to address that challenge of skills and technology. We are looking at the SMEs also assessing the services of government in one-stop shops. That is one of the areas that the Biashara Kenya and the aspect of uh, government leveraging its businesses to the people comes on board. The issues of single business permit will be procured at this point, and the issues of uh, where the market occurs, these SMEs can access it at that particular point in time. So our entrepreneurs can procure a lot of information, can, can got a lot of information from such kind of centers so that they know what exists in other places. So what I can easily see from Adam's point that he could have expounded on are the issues of the roadmap where we are going and how we can create opportunity for the SMEs particularly to address the four areas where we are facing challenge. This is a country where the issues of access to finance keeps on cropping up, and yet when you talk to the financial institutions, the microfinancing, they tell you that their cash boxes are full with money. So where is the problem? Because you talk to the SMEs in this country, why they cannot improve quality, why they cannot get skills, why they cannot get the, 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 their goods, the market, the issues of we cannot access the credit. Why they cannot access the credit, you ask, because the people with the money still see them as high risk. So therefore, one of the interventions that uh, we are looking at as the big corporates come in body, how can we reduce this risk that is perceived to be weighing down the SME so that they cannot give you the quality even if you contract them, you may not get the quality because they cannot employ the right people to do for you what you want. So what is on the table here is how can we leverage credit referencing platform that is already in this country so that the SMEs that are the lower bottom of the ranks can get the credit from the financial institutions with that risk exposure reduced. So we need innovative ideas on how the SMEs can be leveraged in such a way that uh, those with innovative ideas, can the innovative ideas be something that becomes a tool or an instrument that makes someone access the finances with the, the supplies and the orders that they could come across. That is one question that is asking. There's one other question that I'm seeing, Adam is posing that uh, is relevant for this is, where are the opportunities particularly in East African Kenya, 
and uh, the importance of the government and private sector to find ways to work together. And one area where it's identifying is that one of access to credit, how the SMEs can get credit to supply the qualities, to get the technologies, to get the skills, so that that market can be addressed. I think that is one area where it's looking at. What have other countries like India done to remove the risk averseness that is there and the fear that uh, this is a sector that you cannot give long-term business, you cannot give them long-term credit to acquire the technologies, to acquire the, the input that they need so that uh, the large corporates can be comfortable with them. Then another thing is, are there emerging business models that can be transported across geographies or across continents like to Africa or to Kenya from Asia leveraging on the SMEs linkage with the, with the corporates so that uh, those challenges that we continue to see is, because this point is, we need sustainable businesses. And uh, many countries believe that uh, not FDI alone can uh, change the face of poverty that we are seeing. If we leave the local entrepreneurs behind, then we are not going to remove the social challenges that we have because gifts alone and donations alone are not going to, to get. Therefore, how can we get market-based approaches to nurture entrepreneurship and innovation that will help to create jobs? This country and the new government has a target of one million jobs per year. How can we build that culture of entrepreneurship for quality products and services at affordable prices that everyone will be comfortable with? So this is uh, the question that uh, Adan is uh, posing to this forum so that we think around those and then once we get that, we believe that we'll catalyze the growth in small and medium enterprises so that we can both score what we want to get because with continuing insecurity, no FDI will come. So without sustainability, no entrepreneur will be comfortable to invest in these areas. And we believe that we need to map the whole landscape of SMEs to see which areas can we go and link up with the large corporates and what practical solutions can we have so that uh, people can afford the services by themselves. Because without doing that, then we'll always be talking about assistance and donations and all that that are not sustainable. These are the questions that uh, he could have expounded one million times, but I know those are the directions that uh, Adam could have gone. Therefore, he's saying that there's need now to build strong ecosystem to support entrepreneurship that nurtures innovation, and that is what is heartening for him to see how the Sankam Forum in Africa can become a catalyst. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okeo, for that very, very insightful uh, speech. I'd like to invite, uh, can you please stay on stage? <laughs> I'd like to invite Mr. Anand, the, the CEO of IntelliCap, to, um, to give away a small token of our appreciation.